Cool. All right. Well, um, everyone, I'm Stephen Murray of Murray Family Farms. Uh, so get rid of that thing at the right. Yeah. So um, my family, we run a family business called Murray Family Farms. It's uh, real important to me. It's my last name. <laughs> So uh, it's very important that we grow quality stuff. Let's you're see. You're like third generation too. Uh, I'm a second. So my, I'm a, I'm a sixth generation California farmer. Yeah. But my family are. I'm the second generation of of our family. So when my dad was young, um, my grandfather passed away, and my dad restarted everything uh, from the beginning as a farmer. But um, <laughs> let's see how I go to the next slide on here. Real um just how do i just make the slide go oh do i just touch it mm -hmm. okay so just touch it okay cool so um i'm going to be talking about some various stuff um i'm going to be talking about some of the things i'm growing at murray family farms currently i have about 900 species of about 3000 varieties of fruit so um <laughs> i have quite a bit of stuff then I'll, I'll talk about some fruits of the Americas that have some commercial potential that I've been working with a little bit. Uh, I'll talk about my experiences as an exchange student. Um, lately, I've been traveling to Africa a lot. Um, I was in Africa. So I've now been to 105 countries. So I've, I've passed my 100 country mark, which is pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, and I was in Ghana, Togo, Benin, and Tunisia in, um, in uh, January looking at fruit too. And then uh, after that, it'll be different fruits from around the world and just lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of fruits because there's a lot of fruits. All right. So um, first of all, this is our booth. So at Murray Family Farms, we grow a lot of different stuff. And our goal is to have it beautiful with lots of diversity. And this is a, a great example of a fruit display. That's a Santa Monica. Uh, th market. This this was at the Hollywood Farmers Market. Oh, Hollywood. Okay. So in the spring, we'll do up to about thirty farmers markets locally. We sell to specialty produce. Yeah. So um, they're you know Bob real well. Oh yeah, yeah. Bob Bob's pretty Bob's cool. Bob presented to us as well. Oh really? And okay. uh, he's a quite a world traveler. Yeah, yeah. And, and they've they've been buying a lot of cool stuff. Um, in here, you know, we have a lot of goals, and we want to have a beautiful display. We want to have it full. We have to have a certified organic. And um, we want everyone to come by and have a you know an excellent experience. So one of the things I do is I sell things by the basket. And this is a nice looking display where you can see elderberry fruit, elderberry flowers, passion fruits. Uh, we have a soft seeded strawberry guava. And then you got Che. And then we have nice. Che fruit, yeah. And Che fruit tastes a lot like watermelon. And I'll talk more about, um, I actually traveled across China looking for chai fruit, which in Chinese is zhi wo, which is a very uncommon character. So it's a, a ye sheng wo, or wild fruit. I called Vicky to see if you could get some cuttings of chai. Yeah, I, I, did, I ran out of time. I ran out of time. So I, I literally arrived yesterday at 1.30 back into the United States. And then I've just been all over the place since then. And then tomorrow I'm going to be in, in San Bernardino County. Um, but here's an example of one of our booths. So you can see we have our beautiful Rainier cherries in tubs. And this is a pretty nice booth, but he's wearing a t-shirt. So he shouldn't be wearing a t-shirt. But you can still see how pretty all the different fruit is. It's kind of hard to see, uh, but there's a, a lot of exotic fruit inside of this display. Uh, I've got, these are uh, raisin fruit, quinces, Buddha's hands, lotus persimmons and just a lot of different stuff. And what I do is I grow my exotic fruits and then people can pre-order those items and then pick it up in the Santa Monica Wednesday Farmer's Market. Wow. And so these were all fruit that were sold before the market started of unusual stuff. And I actually received a scholarship, multiple scholarships from the California Rare Fruit Growers. And um, yeah, and then it, it helped me to go to Ch China. So I lived in China. I took my upper division classes in Chinese. And uh, I was very much helped by the California Rare Fruit Growers and the Wong Family Scholarship. And um, that really helped. And uh, I love fruits and I really like them. And, you know, there's going to be a lot of just different fruits that you'll see that are pretty cool that I'm excited about. Like uh, there's rose apples are the yellow fruits on the middle part that they just taste like rose fragrance. They're really delicious. 
What, what was the red fruit that looks like it on, on the stem like Kubota kava at the so, bottom? So the, the red fruit with, with the fruit on the stem, those are sea buckthorn. Oh, sea buckthorn. Yeah. yeah. So so those are sea buckthorn, uh, which are in the Eliagnaceae family. Uh, they're a, a nitrogen fixing plant, but it, they, they need very cold winters. So mm -hmm. it, it probably you guys don't get enough chilling for those ones here, but mm -hmm. I'm lucky where I am, um, we, we get chilling and not chilling depending on the site. Oh, it was a question? about the rose apple. You talked about the Yeah, they're, they're very hardy. Uh, they can probably take it to about 22 degrees pretty comfortably. There's not very many selections of them. Most of them are seedling selected plants. In Thailand, I found, found fruits that were this big of them. Yeah, but sure. there's, there's, there's about 700 species of syzygiums, which is wow. the genus of rose apples. And they're they vary from awful to pretty good. <laughs> um, and part of what we do is our goal is to have fruit year round. So this is in the in uh, the winter time, and you can see just we have sunflowers, and it just we always want to have it beautiful, eye catching, and every week people come to see what's cool. So this is in uh, in February. Um, we we have fifty eight varieties of citrus. And each one of these containers is another kind of citrus. And what's been happening is originally we grew navel oranges, but you know you can buy a 10 pound bag of navels for $10. And instead with um, orange quats, I'm selling those for $5 a pound and nobody has orange quats and the, per the yield is pretty similar and I make more money per acre. Hmm. So um, I'm getting rid of the more common citrus and I'm putting more and more unusual citrus, sudachi, yuzu, uh, bergamot and other different types i just found out yesterday you can the fruit can go anywhere it's only the foliage and the fruit. yes you're not allowed to have foliage on the fruit so um you can't have leaves on the fruit there, there's different quarantine zones right. we don't have um we have not had any incidences of the huang long being disease in kern county um but there have been yeah, you, you can bring the fruit, but you're supposed to clean the leaves off and uh, you can bring the fruit. Yeah. So um, but the, the rules with citrus, you cannot move citrus plants around. Right. Yeah. And so you have so so when I want to buy citrus plants, I have to specifically order them to be grafted by a nursery if it's not like a publicly available variety. Right. So um, I work with uh, trade. Um, Four Winds Nursery, they have a good selection. They have mail order if you guys want to buy plants. They're a pretty good source. Uh, Trade Winds. Four Winds. Or Four Winds, yeah, Four Winds. Trade Winds is the seed company, but for the um, the Four Winds, they, they, they are available for online purchase of them. And then another, um, there's, there's a company called Wood Lake that also has, um, you know, you, you have to have the covers and everything, and I get a bunch of citrus from them too. What about, do you ever just, from the, uh, the California yeah so so if I want to graft them myself um I um I, I I have gotten cyan woods but I don't get a huge take so a lot of times I'll I'll have someone else do that for me so so um Wood Lake is able to do that and then we have another company locally that's WN which used to be called Willis and Newcomb so they they will graft things, but I have to order at 50 trees minimum if yeah. they're going to graft them for me. So it's like I want to get more um, Nippon orange quats because I think the Nippon orange quat is an interesting uh, citrus and there's no one who sells them. So I have to make an order of that myself in order to get them. <laughs> so um, th these are our headquarter location. This is the oh, big the red big barn. barn. Huh. And then we got the little purple barn. And so the big red barn uh, is about a 10,000 square foot building. And uh, we have a huge Oktoberfest tours, and it's it's a pretty cool place to check out. Um, this is a copy of my small lots of seed import permit. So if you want to bring seeds in the United States, you can do it. You can bring in 50 seeds of 50 varieties as long as it's not narcotic, invasive, CITES listed, endangered. But most stuff, if you use this, you, you have to have an itemized list, send it to the inspection station, and they'll forward it to you, and they're very friendly. They're not as friendly if you don't do this, <laughs> but uh, I'd recommend everybody look into it. So that's my import permit. Um, and then here, these are our cherry trees. And what we're doing with cherries is we're growing them very differently than most. 
we're using a super high density where we have 32 scaffolds. So this tree here has 32 separate branches and um, it's kind of hard to tell, but um, what we do is we prune it and then we prune it again until we have 32. And then that divides up the, all the vigor of the tree and we're able to pick the entire tree with no ladders. It's, it's dropped our, our pruning cost to about $2 per tree when it used to be about $28 per tree. Wow. And um, it makes it so that all the vigor is gone. So you can take any branch, pull it over and pick all the fruit. And you don't need a ladder. It's a great system. Do you have uh, the height of these is about 10 feet tall, but it can be as much as 15. You can still pull the branches over. Do you have the uh, you picks on the cherries as well as the strawberries? And we, we, yeah, so so we have strawberry and blueberry you pick at the uh, 58 location, and then we have cherry you pick at the little purple barn location. Okay. Uh, question? How do you uh, pet and get animals here? As far as which animals, like birds? Birds. Yeah, so, so we, we will, depending on where it is, we have sound machines, popping machines that are propane cannons. We cover them with uh, with with um, Bird with net. netting, yeah, uh, with bee netting. And then there's different stuff that we do depending on what the pest is and what the, the specific issue is. A oh, question? This shape here up to here. It's easy. You cut everything that grows horizontally. You only leave vertically, and you make sure that you have. Uh, the, the the 28 scaffolds. And then every three years, you cut the five biggest branches with three nodes be below and then reinvigorate the tree. So are you kind of a spare yard. Say it again? Can you do it with any other fruit? Yeah, you, it works well with stone fruits, um, thing, things that have a lot of vigor. So this divides up the vigor. So if it's got a lot of growth, then you can pull it apart. But these are a higher chill cherry. We these, wouldn't be able to these, throw it down here. These, these are low chill cherries too. Huh? So, so, so that we have low and high chill cherry varieties. So, some of the newly released ones would grow around here pretty well. It's right now, basically around here, all we're growing is Royal Lee, Mini Royale, and one other. Yeah. So there's there's uh, Casa Casa Melina. There's Royal Rain. There's there's Royal Lee, Mini uh, Mini yeah. Royal, and then there's another one called Royal Lynn. And Royal Lynn is probably the, the better one of the, the new varieties around here, but you have to have two for cross-pollinization because right. they're self-incompatible. Two, two different varieties. You, you, you can't, ch cherries need two varieties to produce fruit. It, 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 even then, so, so there's, it, there, there, there's, it's called four, four prime. Uh, so, so cherry propagation, they're, they're, what they have is they have these things called alleles, where it'll be one, two, one, three, one, four, one, five, one, six, you know, seven, eight, uh, nine, ten. It, it's one of those things. And you have to have at least one number different for them to be able to cross-pollinate oh, each right. other. Yeah. So if you have two varieties, they have to be varieties that are different enough that they can be pollinated. So it doesn't work with all of them. Um, so like, for example, if you have Bing, Teleri has the same numbers. They're both one threes. So if you had a Teleri next to a Bing, they would not be able to cross pollinate each other. So you have to have at least one allele number different for them to pollinate each other. And that's unique about cherry genders. So there's 13 possible genders that a cherry can have, and you have to have one of both codes, but it's, it's very technical. So, uh, <laughs> for, for the home grower, just have two varieties and that should probably be good. <laughs> Uh, it's a uh, Royal Lynn is uh, R O Y A L Lynn L Y N N. that. Yeah, and that's another. That's a new low chill cherry. It needs about three hundred to four hundred hours, so not very much. So here we have some beautiful cherries. We have big cherries, and we have a, have club varieties where we're the only growers of them in the entire world. So a lot of our genetics you can only find at our farm, including that is an Arvin Glen in that photo. Uh, here's some new varieties, like in the middle there is the, the GG1 cherry. Some of these cherry varieties can get this big. That's that's yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a... Point that out, that's incredible. Yeah, so so the GG1, this one here, we're the only farm that has this variety. So it's a, it's a big, big cherry. It's, it's very, very high acid and high sugar. So mm. it bricks is about 30. Tangy, sweet, like... Like a Suriname cherry in a way. Yeah, I but, mean, but, but sweeter. Sweet yeah, yeah, but a lot sweeter. Yeah. And then, but the cool thing is that variety, you can use it for both fresh eating or cooking. A lot of cherries are sweet. There's not enough acidity to give them flavor. 
that one you can do whatever you want with it. And that's one of your own homegrown. I mean, yeah, home. Uh, yeah, that's propagated. One, of, one of our own varieties called the GG1. And then if you guys want to look up my stuff, I have on Instagram, uh, Murray Stephen A2. And then I have my page, Stephen Murray's Rare Fruit. And I'm just always posting fruit stuff. So everywhere I go, there's stuff about fruit. So I love fruit. Fruit's just, I'm crazy about it. And then, like I said, the idea is to have fruit year round. And one of my favorite unusual fruits that we have, and I brought a bunch of them, are these guys here. This is our my white chatoot mulberry. And they're super, super sweet. And I have a lot of them. So you guys will get to try those a bit later. Uh, white sha toot. So sha is C-H-A-H. Toot is Farsi for mulberry. T-O-O-T. They can get huge. So mulberries, you have to prune them a lot if you want them to stay small. Or you can graft them. If you use a, a Morris nigrum or um, as a rootstock, that'll take away a lot of the vigor. Um, but mulberries can get very, very big. They can be very happy. Yeah. Uh, question back there? I do not sell the, the, the cuttings of them. I, I probably have maybe 15 different kinds of mulberries or maybe 16 of about uh, eight species. The So mulberries are very easy to propagate. You just yeah. take a cutting, put it in the ground and they grow. But oh. the, the roots can be especially Pakistan. Pakistan can get 80 feet tall. So the, the trees can be really huge. But we grow pomegranates. There's jujubes. This is uh, a fruit from, from China. Um, here's figs. So right now we're planting more and more figs. We now have a total of about 60 different varieties of figs. Um, and every single little pile is another kind of fig. Uh, Buddha's hands is one of the items that's been really popular on the farm. So this is a fingered citron from China. How do you mix that? Yeah, good question. Do, do you grow the etrog as well for uh, uh, the jurist? I, I have a little bit of etrog, um, but this is is an example of unusual fruit in the late fall that is citrus. Yeah. Um, and then here would be in in uh, in March the different citrus that's available. So uh, we we grow uh, four different kinds of blood oranges. I've been planting more and more of a different blood orange. That's that's the 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 vanilla acidless blood orange. But you can see a lot of different kinds of citrus. So there's the, and one of our, our our most popular though are the Tahitian pomelos, and they're a, a white fleshed um, pomelo, and we hand net them so that they become seedless, mm. and then they taste like limeade, and it's one of our most popular fruits. What's hand netting? So we use bee netting, uh, which is like super fine, cover the whole thing, and then the bees can't go in to pollinate them. And that makes them partheocarpic or seedless. Mm -hmm. um, and here on, on one side is uh, Diospersus lotus or the lotus persimmon or the lotus fruit. And then this is just one of the gruias. And there's like a thousand gruias. So you guys don't need to know about gruias. They're, they don't, they're not that good. Most of, well, well, one of them is good. Falsa from India. That's pretty good. But the other gruias, yeah. Uh, yeah. You want to grapefruit? Grapefruits? Okay. Cocktail, yeah, I have a lot of cocktail grapefruit, yeah, a lot of that one, and they're always seeded though. There's no way to control the seeds on that one. Um, so this is the Murray Berry. Um, this is something that I guess my grandfather uh, had this planted in his yard, and then my dad had a couple plants in Riverside, and we did a genealogy on it, and it is a heat tolerant raspberry. That is a cross between a Japanese wine berry and Australian wild raspberry that can survive in temperatures of 110. So it produces lots and lots of fruit. And then on the other side is the um, more of the white chatoots, which you guys will get to try there. And the white chatoots taste like honey, like, like honey and melon, a great fruit. Uh, this is a new fruit that's from my experiments. This is called chanyar. It is a fruit native to the Atacama Desert that is a member of the Fabaceae or pea family. And they produce these orange fruits and taste like jujubes, but they ripen midsummer. And I, I think I'm the one of the first people growing these as a commercial crop in the United States. I got this from a seed explorer, Joseph Simcox. He imported seeds 2006 and I've grown them out 
and growing them myself. Here's some various um, mulberry varieties. This one is a Morris macrocarpa or the Himalayan long. And these things, every once in a while, you'll find one that's like this long. And they're very thin. They're a red mulberry and they're super sweet and they have a nice amount of acid kick. Uh, but the problem is they're only ripe for like eight days. So they have a super short season. On the other side are more of the white chatoots. Love those. You guys will get to try a good amount of them because I have, I have a decent amount of those over and, there. And what's funny is they're almost as sweet as the uh, as the others. That... Oh, yeah. But they're, but they're also almost acidless. So um, the, the chatoots, those, well, I mean, chatoot just means king mulberries. That's, those are, yeah. And very... they, they make sugar out of them. Oh, yeah. They're, they're Pakistan. very, very sweet. And then over here, I've got some other cool stuff. So this is tropical apricot is the first one is uh, I've got a giant plant that I got at the 2003 Festival of Fruits that was hosted mm -hmm. at Cal Poly Pomona. So I joined the CRFG in 1998. So I've been a member of the CRFG for 26 years. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been doing this like a really, really, really long time. <laughs> so this plant has been in my greenhouse since 2003. And then next to it's uh, key apples. I've got like maybe eight selections of key apples and then pineapples. And I, I was doing really good with pineapples until the rodents realized they were edible. And now I can't produce any pineapples in the greenhouses. That's not a very ripe kai apple there in the middle. Oh, yeah, it's not ripe. It's not yeah. ripe. It's, it's just an example of it. I, I have better yeah. photos. I probably could switch that brought one some ripe ones in today. And then we grow watermelons. We have yellow flesh and red flesh varieties. And this is just an image of just the chaos in my greenhouse. And it's just really, wow. really chaos -y. So Fantastic. one really cool thing that just happened is, uh, so we've got a grant to put in greenhouses and we're going to be putting in, it's going to be like four acres of greenhouses. That's going to be 30 feet tall. Wow. And so in the 30 foot tall greenhouse, I'm going to be able to just go crazy and, and, and grow like some crazy stuff. So I'm really excited. Um, my greenhouse needs help, but, um, once I have a really big area, um, one of the neighbors had these big structures and they're removing it all and we're, we're going to, we're going to save it. So I'm, I'm super excited about that. So this is like from 20 years ago now, these are like some of the first fruits that ripen in the greenhouse. And that's just to show kind of some of the first stuff that started, but you can see one of the Suriname cherry varieties. I've, I have 68 different kinds of Suriname cherries. I probably want to just murder like most of them, but I have Suriname cherries that are like, you know, this big and black. And I have some that are this big and then they're ridgeless where they have no ridges on them. Hmm. And um, that one was called Shalom's Giant. And yeah, there's just for million. There's there, there were so many selections that were made uh, in like 2004, 2003. And I bought 60 of them and then it was a, it was a mistake. But you throw a lot of the poha. Uh, poha, I have at time, but they're annuals, uh -huh. so they die and then they get replaced. Yeah. When I was in China, I love them as a doorway fruit. Oh yeah, in, in in China they had a selection that that had fruit about that big. Wow, it tastes like uh, Manila mangoes, and they were really good. Uh, a question over there? Yeah, you showed a couple of slides back the uh, the tropical apricot, and one of the members brought some and said, "Hey, I'm just curious what you did." Uh, the, good they're very sour <laughs> sure yeah i'll eat one I, I eat all the fruit so um there was a guy named i i saw the picture over there yeah they call it gooseberry ceylon gooseberries ah extremely sour so so then this is called a ketambella which is related to uh the tropical apricot and it's one of the parents and these are very sour how can you up that's tar tarter than a yeah. kai apple. Yeah, they're very good. Tarter than a kai apple. Very good. That uh, question. That is called exploding pepper. It also called acho uh, ach achoka. They're native to. It's a genus uh, from the the um, the cucurbacea family. That um, they produce these fruits that taste like cucumbers, and they're also called stuffing cucumbers, is one of the common names, or exploding cucumbers. They're really good. And then peanut butter fruit, myrtles, and that's the one on the left. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And then everywhere I go, I'm looking for cool fruits. So this is from finding landscaping different lily pilly selections. And this was one of my friends who works for specialty produce. He found these huge lily pillies, and I've been propagating lily pillies that I collect. 
because there's rare fruit everywhere. And like, I'll pull, if I see a cool looking tree, I'll pull off the side of the freeway and just like run into the bushes and get it. And this was, I mean, these are huge for, for lily pillies. These things are like this big. And so they taste like wax jambu. Um, there are, like I said, 600 species of syzygiums. I've probably only eaten maybe 200, but that's still a lot. Not all of them are good, but there are good ones out there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. There's quite a few non-astringent ones or low. Th this one is a low astringency. It's, it's, it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. And they're they're big. Um, oh, okay. Here's the ketumbella on the corner there. Um, That's not not a moya. And then yeah, that that was a El Bumpo selection of cherimoya that I had from one of the trees with uh, Rick uh, Yesiman, who's a member of the Orange County chapter. A, a really good one are midgen berries. This is Ostromyrtus. It's a fruit from Australia. They grow great in the greenhouse. The fruit don't weigh very much, but they've got little blue polka dots. And then on the other side was a selection of natural plum that originally natural plums were introduced as a crop and now they're just la landscaping. And I think you could very easily make some selections of natural plums that would just grow great, produce well. And as long as you, you know, you get rid of the latex, I think, I think people would buy them. If they do make jam with them. Oh yeah. Well, but as a fresh item, as a fresh item. And then in the U S there's native fruits that taste pretty good. One of the better California native fruits, is the lemonade berry, which is from the Roost genus, the, uh, a type of um, sumac. There's a lot of edible sumacs. And then I think that there's some very nice Catalina Island cherries. And then some Washingtonian selections can have really big fruits too. But the, I, I found some really nice uh, Catalina Island cherries. I've been propagating those out. I, I tried to do some crosses with Catalina and other cherries and didn't really get much luck on it. But that's, these are California native genetics. Like the native fruit, fruit that does the best for me, though, are elderberries. And so I grow a lot of elderberries and sell a lot of elderberry fruit. And that's the real Steve with the hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how we normally yeah. see you. Usually I wear a hat, so I'm, I'm yeah. missing the hat this time. So the, it's the Mexican elderberry, I guess it's the common standard name. The fruit is edible because there's some to treat us whether you should cook it first or whether you can. I've eaten a few raw and didn't hurt me, but. Yeah, I, so so the the. They're variable on flavor. They're variable on yield. They're variable on seasonality. I have an ever bearing selection that I found in the hills that once it starts blooming in the spring, it'll have fruit all summer until New Year's. Wow! wow. So it never stops producing elderberries, um, but you, they have to be fully colored. You should not eat them green. Yeah. Um, and generally people prepare them with other stuff mm. uh, or cook them. Uh, so there's, there's, uh, it's kind of argued. Some people say it's Sambucus Mexicana. Some people call it Sambucus nigrum Mexicana, variety Mexicana. Some people call it Sambucus serif, serifolia. So um, the cladistics of, of the Sambucus genus are a bit complicated, but there is, um, I, I have, I have Canadiensis nigrum. I have one called gold bear and a couple other selections. So I think I have maybe four or five species of elderberries. The red one, though, has to be completely cooked. There's also a ton of native lyceum. So lyceum is the genus of goji berries, and there's different wild goji berries all around the world, and nobody knows about them. They're super high in antioxidants related to goji berries. On the other side, you can see these guys. Those are Jerusalem artichokes. It's also a, a U.S. native that um, produces a lot. So the biggest of the U.S. native fruits is the pawpaw. Mm -hmm. And I grow pawpaws in the shade. And so you can grow pawpaws if they're protected here in California. And then these are different barrel cactus fruits. So the, the barrel cactus fruits, um, these taste to me a lot like a pickle. And uh, I grow them for fruit production. So this is going to be heart of palm. I grow palm trees to harvest the, the palms. And then this is one of the various uh, different types of, of columnar cactus fruits. There's thousands of edible cactuses. It's just a crazy amount. And then these are wild berries that I collected in the foothills because I go and I hunt for berries and fruits everywhere in the world. Almost looks like a gooseberry. Yeah. So, so those are species of gooseberries. There is a, it's called the wax gooseberry, the western currant, the golden currant, the clove currant, and a bunch of other species. So on here, you can see mahoney on the corner, which is called Oregon grapes, cawthorn fruits, thimbleberries, 
uh, that those are rowans, which uh, the genus is Sorbus. Uh, Saskatoon is the one on the corner there. It's one of my favorite fruits in the world. Uh, we've got uh, one of the currants, and then these they call the melon bush. It's from the asparagus family, but they produce a delicious berry. Mm -hmm. What's the taste on the currant? This one. These taste like jam, blueberries, and uh, almonds. Really, really like them, but they're from a rosacea wow, family. What a cross. One of my favorite of all the fruits in the world is this one. One of the best things. Um, yeah. A long time ago, I was going to buy it or tried to buy a currant bush manufactured from California. Yeah. So, so currants are a spreader of a type of rust that goes into pine trees. It's called white pine rust. And so they're illegal in a lot of states, and that's just completely hampered the distribution. Uh, California is allowed to have them. And um, we're not in one of the states where where white pine is a significant industry, but uh, a lot of states do do not allow them. And often you're not allowed to bring in plant material that's because fine. of it of it being a danger uh, as an economic Consider an invasion, invasive. Some of them can be invasive as well. Uh, so as long as we're talking about import, you blew by your USDA import label real quick. Mm -hmm. So with you constantly bringing stuff in, how are you able to export plant material to it, farmers markets if you're under quarantine for three years for only bring in? Uh, so what it is, is you, so in the, in the state of California, in order to sell the fruit, it has to be producing fruit. So I can only add something to my certificate if it is producing fruit, and most things do not grow as annual crops. So most fruits take three years to produce fruits. So for me to add it, so so in the state of California, if you want to sell things in a farmer's market, you need to produce it yourself. So every single thing I have is in my certified producer certificate, which is a it's a 22 page document. And someone has to physically come with me, go around the entire farm and verify that I'm growing yeah. every single plant that I say I'm growing. And that the time from the plant being planted until producing, it's not on the certificate until it's producing. So that's, it takes three years and it usually takes about four years for most stuff to yeah, start producing. Quarter section be under quarantine. Yeah, until it's yeah. producing. So, but, but if you want to sell any of it, it has to be on your cert. So every year it takes hours and hours and hours to go through recertifying every single thing I've got. And I've got a lot. So, um, yep, I, I graduated with a degree in Chinese language and plant science from Cal Poly Pomona, spent uh, time abroad. So here is, uh, this is my older map of all the places I've been. It's pretty out of date now. I've been to a lot more places, but you can see the green is most of the places I've been to. I've been to more now. Um, now I'm up to I'm up to 13 countries in Africa, and uh, 105 countries across the world. So um, I'm going to start off with some stuff from Zanzibar. I mean, and from and Tanzania. A lot of these you guys might have seen before, but one of the coolest of all are the baobabs. So baobabs is a genus. Um, Bob. Yeah, baobab, baobab, um, adenemia is the genus. There's a there's nine species in the genus. There's like a whole bunch in, in um, Madagascar, one in, in, in Africa, and then one in Australia. And the trees get huge. This is the largest baobab in South Africa. And I was on that branch there, see? Wow. So this, this single tree had a restaurant and bar inside of it <laughs> that had 17 seats. And it's a fruit tree. So it's the largest fruit tree in the world is this tree. Oh, not... or one of them, you know, I mean, the largest I've been in, you know. <laughs> um, here's what the fruit look like. They taste like solid yogurt. <laughs> so, and then they make candies like the candy there. You can see the fruit hanging in the trees. Um, one of the crazy things is that in Africa and across the world, the people are not eating fruit anymore. So instead, people are eating apples, and the apples come from either China or the U.S. They're eating oranges. So like this woman here is selling peeled oranges, and they're selling grapes from Kern County. 
<laughs> so uh, people, you know, as a status thing are not eating the local fruits and a lot of them are disappearing and being forgotten everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I always try to go into the forest, into the markets, into the jungles and just like find stuff like all the time. Just love it. Um, I have a, like a crazy amount of books, but like uh, with my friend Jared, who has the weird fruit channel, we just went into New Caledonia and Australia and just finding fruits. And it's, that's the, no, it's <laughs> to them, it's not a rare fruit that for, for them, it's, it's, it's a low status symbol that people are eating a lot of those things. So it, you know, if someone is eating this, it's getting forgotten about a lot. But for them, it's not rare. It's it's something that, you know, my grandmother used to eat. But here's one thing from Africa that was really cool. This is the coco de mer. It's the world's largest seed. I went to the Seychelles and I wanted to eat one of the fruit. And I could have gotten a poached one, but I didn't. And I never was able to eat it, but they look awesome. <laughs> like they get, they're like, they can be up to 40 pounds for a single seed. Wow. What's the life on the inside? It's uh so at this stage it's 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 solid like ivory, but it so it takes thirty years for them to start producing fruit, and then they'll either be male or female, and it takes nine years for the seed to mature, and between the second year and the sixth year you can eat them, and it starts off being completely liquid like an underripe coconut, and then it gets more and more solid, and the endosperm, which is what you eat in a, in a coconut, solidifies until it becomes hard. So along the way, you can eat it like a coconut oh. at, at different stages of maturity. Uh, Seychelles, which is a country in the Indian Ocean. Uh, here, this one was a fruit I found in Madagascar. Uh, they call them tapia fruits. This is from the gingerbread family of fruits. There's there's like 60 different species of fruits in this family that no one's ever heard of. It tastes like a cross between a lychee and uh, an Asian pear. Um, and in, in Madagascar, people are cutting down a lot of the trees, but these trees are being left because they can harvest the fruit and um, and they taste good. So people on the side of the road would be selling tapia fruits and it's T-A-P-I-A. -A. I can't remember the genus. The other image is called a um, monkey orange or strychnos. And there's about uh, five species that are edible. They're pod-like fruits that are hard as a rock. And they can have shelf life of up to six months. So the benefit is the shelf life. The problem is that the seeds of this, just like the genus, you know, you can guess maybe, is strychnos. So strychnine comes from a strychnose species, strychnose nux vomita, or the vomit nut. And those ones are not good. So you should not eat those. And they do not taste good because I tried one. What, what does the monkey orange taste like? Uh, it tastes a lot like caramel oranges and like jelly really yeah but it's, it's I, I don't think the one i tried was fully ripe. here's another g african genus of edible gingers this is afroganum the afroganum genus has about 200 species they're called grain of paradise you open them they're white inside the black seeds taste like super spicy peppers and then it kind of tastes like sour dragon fruit the white flesh so you got to be careful about because if you chew it it's super spicy but afroganum is the genus this was one that we found in Madagascar. I've eaten the grain of paradise, which is a different species. And I tried another species in Mauritius. Um, so we have safu. Safu or butterfruit tastes like guacamole. So you put them in boiling water for a second and then they just taste like guacamole and they're just like really good. And uh, one of the best fruits of, of Africa. On the other side is one of the various cola species. Oh, question. What are the... Uh, uh, Sorry, I can't remember the name. The guacamole fruit. Uh, Safu, S-A-F-O-U. What is it? What is it related to? So it is in this. It is related to. It's called uh, Sri Lankan olive. There's a um, um, uh, what is the name of the family? Um, it's it's not in the Canarium genus because that's another group of some of them. That's what uh, Dubai is, which is a very similar flavor. But these ones are related to. Um, El El Eliocarpus. So if you've ever heard of Eliocarpus, which you probably haven't, but Eliocarpus has, it's called the Sri Lankan olive or South Indian olive. And they've got a fruit that's about this big. There'll be an image of them a bit later. And they just taste like, like, like a green olive, but it's off of a tree. It just tastes like olives. They're really good. That's the, uh, the Sri Lankan olive, very tasty olive, like, whoops, savory fruit.
Um, this one over here with the spines on it was Ancoba Welwichidae, and they taste like kind of like pumpkin pie with peanuts inside. Oh, that, that was uh, this one here. Uh, that's a really rare South African fruit. And then these are, um, they call it giant mulberry. And that one's native uh, to tropical East Africa. I did not eat them right. I thought you just bite into them, but they had these hairs. It just made my mouth hurt a lot, but <laughs> supposedly you're supposed to take the sections out and pull off like a little edible pot, but I didn't do it right. <laughs> um, so we've got in here, this is uh, Imbe or Garcinia livingstonia. I can tell the genus and species of all of them if you guys want, but Garcinia livingstonia, you've got one plant right there. Uh, <laughs> this, this one, this plant. It's uh, one of the bazillion Garcinias. So the Garcinia genus has like 800 species. Wow. You can find, there's like 40 different Garcinias native just to Madagascar. Like everywhere you go, there's wild Garcinias. And then this is more Safu on the other side. So that's a better improved selection of Safu. And those were just huge. This was a market in Zanzibar. And when I was in Dar es Salaam in mainland, you didn't really see that many kinds of fruits, but Zanzibar has a lot of diversity of fruits, but very few of them are actually endemic. So you have what are what I call pan-tropicals, where you can go anywhere in the tropics and you'll find these 30 things. And so in here, most of this is, is the common ones. This was from an event of South Sudanese students when I was in um, China, and they've got these things, which are called uh, Elliot's. Um, this is a Saharan fruit that you eat this black. It's like resiny black licorice. I was not a very big fan of it. But inside it, of it almost looks like black sapota. Yeah, it's, oh, sorry, Baelidites. Baelidite, B-A-L-I-T-E-S is the genus. Um, it's a, uh, on the north edge, of, on, the, on, on the very south edge of the Sahara, the tree that grows there. Then they also have lots of, these Ruias, which is D R E W I A S. There's tons of species of Ruias across Africa, which there's so many. What was the spelling on the middle one again? Uh, B A L, I think it's Balanites, ba ba B A L A I N T E S, something like that. Okay. Um, one of the, the rarer thing, but that's really popular, are these that are called Mabungo fruits. So Mabungo fruits are from the Apacia family, which is the same family as uh, dogbane, which is a poisonous, poisonous thing. Um, but it's also related to the uh, natal plums. And these grow as a vine. And the people there, these are two different species. Um, it, they're across Africa, and they taste a lot like passion fruits. And people just dig them. They like them a lot. So I made a post on my Stephen Murray's Rare Fruit and every two months, I get a comment from someone from either Tanzania or Kenya asking for this fruit. But it really, it tastes a lot like a passion fruit. Hmm. So it's like a, a passion fruit and an apricot in flavor. And it's uh, Landolfia is one of the ways people say the scientific name. Uh, L-A-N-D, Landolf, A-L-P-H-I-A, uh, or Sabia, which is S-A-B-I-A, -A, same thing. Um, Comorensis. Randall, yeah, that was, was that the rubber plant that they used to grow? Yes, this is also has white latex and it is used as a rubber source. So those ones would be for the latex, but exactly, it is a rubber source. Yeah. When you go to these various countries, is it just that you know the right questions to ask to find these rare fruits? Or when you venture in the market, do you have sort of a guy that's like, hey, I know. I, I know. So what I do is I go to markets, I go to botanical gardens, I stop on the side of the road, and I do, huh? Yeah, yeah. So, but but I I also I've read lots and lots and lots and lots of books on fruit, so I can tell most stuff on a family level. And then like uh, I have a friend in Madagascar that he says, "What's this plant?" And then I was like, "Oh, well, let me find out." And there's only there's only like 500 edible species of fruit. So mm -hmm. I went through a list that listed every single species, looked up every single species, looked up every scientific article I could find on every single species, looking at 
the flowers, the growth of it all. And now I've looked at all different species that, that have been categorized as edible from, you know, there's only maybe, maybe 27 species, families of edible fruits that exist there. So it's not, it's not, you know, there's not that many. Yeah. So, so like I, I was in, um, I was in Fiji and New Caledonia and Vanuatu. And before going there, I researched the different fruits that could be found there and then went through the the species checklist. And then I check on, um, there, there's websites where, where when people see plants in the wild, it'll recognize where they exist. And I'll see where people have seen the species, if I'm really looking for that specific species. But uh, I'm also a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers. And then I'm very involved online in rare fruit groups. So I have contacts in most large metropolitan areas of the world. And then I study languages. So I read material in all the languages I do. So I speak, I speak Spanish and I speak Portuguese and then Mandarin Chinese. And then I've studied Romanian. That's what I've currently just finished a program in Romania. And then I'm trying to learn Farsi, uh, Farsi Yakami Baladam. So a little bit of Farsi. And then uh Hindi Tori Tori Shamashtaiku. So you know, and a little bit of Hindi. And then um Nina Fahamo Kiswahili Kidogo, so a little bit of Kiswahili. And then um she tous les français pour deux ans de secondaire et pour ces raisons je peux comprendre la langue mais si on est passionné n'est pas non plus utile pour ces raisons je ne parle jamais um so i can get by in french um and then i speak David portuguese Clark probably likes to pick your brain for some of his articles we we're very good friends i talk to david weekly so um uh, david carp who wrote for the new york times and la times about fruit he just yeah. writes he's very quite colorful quite very detailed articles yeah. about fruits yeah. he does a lot of research he's a cool guy um Here's another fruit. This is one that you find a lot in landscaping. That is the um the it's the the the, the common name in the US is, is a swear word in South Africa. So I don't really like saying the common name of that fruit. So in South Africa, it's a very bad word um, for that fruit. Um but they taste good. It's 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 so it, it's it's kaffir, it's kaffir. Yeah, so kaf kaffir mean oh, yeah. it's it's based on arabic for non-believer and then it's 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 become a slang in south african english for um it's, it's a, for yeah it's a bad word is that the same one that you grow with on the leaf no that that's the kaffir lime this is the kaffir plum so this is from the anacaracea family or the same family as mangoes oh. so these taste a lot like the what they call ciuelas in mexico or hecotes or mombin there's like there's a ton of fruit very similar to mangoes hmm. um yeah like maybe 400 to, to 800 species that are wow. mango light so this is one of them that grows great around here you see them in landscaping and they're all over the place so once you notice that these exist you'll see them like on the side of the highway or so so this is one that i actually found on the roadside in south africa and then this is a relative of it marula which is also from the same subgroup of anacaraceae they make it into an alcoholic drink, and then when monkeys eat it, they get drunk and they get all messed up. It's a great, it's a cool thing. And then here are some huge ones that I found in Laguna Beach. So this is off of the 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 one, um, and it's just in landscaping. Really great size, little bunches. No one giving it any attention, and they're great. And they didn't even know it was a fruiting. Oh actually, yeah, no no idea. Fruit. Yeah. It was, it was planted a while ago. Now there's just old trees across the state and I, you find them all over the place. A lot of them here in San Diego. Like a, like a little mango, about this big. The seed's huge. The flesh to seed ratio is not very good, but it's still a cool fruit. Uh, there's macadamia nuts. So I was in South Africa in the Limpopo region and they're just planting tons and tons of macadamias. That's a filbert on the top. That's not a macadamia. So here's uh, life and produce in China. This is, was a photo with my brother at uh, Peking University at, in front of the Nameless Lake. So the name of the lake is the Nameless Lake. Um, yeah. So I really like China. Um, yeah. So I, I can speak Chinese and I go to China and I just go into the middle of nowhere and I go into the countryside and look for fruits. And when I was going to China, I spent two uh, weeks going down the Yangtze River, stopping village to village to village and just going out and just finding cool stuff. So th this was the variety of physalis or ground cherry or poha or goldenberry. It's got like yeah. 30 common names in English. 
And these ones tasted like natives. Really probably the best tasting one I've tried. This one over here is one of the red flesh kiwis. This is one of the giant hawthorn apples. There's a lot of varieties of them. A native apple, pretty good pomegranate. And then this is, there's a, it's called paper mulberries. There's a two uh, species of paper mulberries that have decent fruits. So these are paper mulberry species, which is brassifolia. Yeah. I, I got another slide about that. That, that. That's later on. I researched the young may probably, I think Ty, Tymon is here, right? I thought I saw Tymon, huh? Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, Tymon- You could go another 20 minutes easy. Oh yeah, I, I got, I have a lot. So it's, uh, I think we're at like a third of it. So <laughs> like, if you want me to keep going, I've got a lot, a lot, a lot of stuff in here. Um, I'll start going faster then. So, um, there's a lot of fruit ahead. So in here, that's jujube, uh, goji berry. This was going on the Yangtze River. Uh, here are wild fruits I found collecting throughout China, including wild tea, uh, car traps. And then this one here was one of the soap berries that just buzzed up my mouth. Here was collecting che fruit germplasm across China, going to rural places. And these are all different che fruits that are a wild fruit or a zhonghua bindi to ye shenghua. So a wild native fruit of China that nobody in China knows what they are. Um, and then these are my own selections. I even have my own variegated variety, lots of different kinds of mushrooms in China. Uh, this, these are different nuts, including um, an edible taria species. Here are the um, hawthorn apples. They get really big. Um, on the top there, that is the uh, shangchun, which tastes like top ramen. They're delicious. Chinese cherries, mulberry selections. Uh, going through Southern China, this is a uh, another kind of a relative of the um, mangosteen, the the green types of jujubes, mm. another type of syzygium wild in China. Um, here's young maize. Um, I imported 300 fruits with, with Tidman and the, uh, 300 plants with him. A bunch of them didn't survive. I tried three times to bring in plant material. I brought in a total of about 500 plants and about 20 of them lived. So you, you get about a 5% take on them. And then I have uh, been propagating them out. So I probably have about 60 plants and it just, it sucks to grow them. They're hard to grow. They die. They die all the time. Very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there can be pests on them. If, if there is pest on them, that then often they don't go through quarantine. You generally have to get them and immediately try to graft them on a rootstock. And it's just been really difficult to grow them. This is me in a yurt. I went to Xinjiang on the border of Kazakhstan. These are fruits grown wild in Xinjiang, including sea berry cultivars. And then this is a fruit that grows in sand dunes from the Nitria genus, a super interesting family of fruits that lives across deserts of the world that produces grape-like fruit about this big, can grow in all the world's desert and in areas of super high salinity. Really cool genus. These are improved sea berry selections. Um, let the traveling begin. Oh, this was in Myanmar. Beautiful Myanmar. Here's Malaysian different kinds of fruits. This is the Nipa palm, which uh, is, is that guy on the corner. They taste like coconut. They can grow in salt water. One of the few uh, uh, types of mangroves with edible fruits. There's only about five species of mangrove plants that live in salt water that produce edible fruits. And that's one of them. Uh, you can see chep, uh, Chepidec, which is a jackfruit relative, long slot durian. Uh, you can see, you know, that's another Artocarpus species, which is from the same family as, as jackfruit. Uh, in the middle there, that's a kind of a nut that they call Thai almond, um, drinks made out of uh, gak fruit, and then different kinds of salic or salicaceae, which is the, another group of edible palm fruits. This on the top is one of the really large varieties of Eliagnus or Soshang, or that one's probably Eliagnus latifolia. I've got about 30 different species of, of, um, of Eliagnaceae, another kind of jujube on the top, and other real interesting stuff. Those are giant bale fruits. Bale fruits are a super interesting group of fruits. This is in Myanmar now. Um, and this variety had fruit about this big. You crack it open and then it tastes like orange marmalade inside. Tastes like what? Orange marmalade. Really? The problem is they're a citrus relative. So it's very difficult to distribute budwood of good bale fruit or belly fruit varieties. Bale fruit, B A E L. Uh, is is the genus, um, I mean, is the common name of it. 
There is a limonessa, which is called the wood apple, which is in the next image. That's what these ones on the far side are. They make shakes out of that. You can see the inside of the bale fruit in that middle image. Uh, then that's the Sri Lankan olive. And then that's a sterculia. There's like 700 species of edible sterculia, um, which are nuts. Uh, here, those are the maprang, which they're calling um, mango plums. They taste a lot like mangoes. They're closely related to mangoes. Uh, uh, each one of these is another kind of date. Uh, going through India with my friend Sri Kumar, I sent seeds to 27 farms in India. Then I spent a month going farm to farm to farm up the west coast of India, village to village to village to village alone. Great time. Um, including we've got the in the middle is the toddy palm. Those are delicious. Jackfruit everywhere. Yeah. Um, these are local Artocarpus species. On this side is called wild jack, which is Artocarpus harus, and that is lacucha or Artocarpus lacucha. Um, more kinds of fruits. Um, the mangosteen relative in the middle is delicious. Um, th that's an Ardesia species in the middle. That mangosteen in the middle up there? No, no, no. That That is a different, um, that is Garcinia. Um, just the Garcinia species. Uh, I can't remember off the top of it. It looks almost like mangosteen, uh, uh, the outer. Uh... Yeah, it, it's it's similar to mangosteen. It's, it's a little smaller, very sweet, yeah. Five minutes? Okay. Well, I've got hundreds of photos. So this is Salakia chinensis. I've got, these are all different kinds of fruits found in the jungles of India. Things in Turkey, going through Turkey. I was an assistant grafter for two weeks, grafting around Turkey, different kinds of olive selections, drying figs, lots of different kinds of uh, things, different markets of, uh, there. This was going through the Philippines. Those are the marang. These are delicious on the top up there. Yellow mango Durian on the bottom? Uh, yeah, it's giant durians. Uh, this is different kinds of pachyfloras, markets of, uh, of Colombia. These are uh, rubus uh, rosifolia. Those are the, um, the peach palms are delicious. And then those are the matizias, which are great. Here's my haul of going with my cousin here to Colombia. So we were in Colombia and I just bought all kinds of crazy stuff. That is a Nona purpurea, uh, tastes like, and then that's a kubwasu. Uh, these were different things I found while in Madagascar, including those nuts that are shaped like that. And you can see that some of the stuff mentioned earlier. Uh, go Traveling through the markets there, going through Fiji. You can see the Fijian nuts or Evie nuts are delicious. Evie nuts, a great fruit. You can different peppers and other stuff. The round bananas, different sugar canes. New Zealand, um, they, they have... That on the other side was the kadaku, which was one Black of the local uh, stuff. These are the new peekaboo pika, fruits going through Australia. This is the native there, uh, native rubus. We've got the different um, capris, capris uh, arborum, which they call the native orange grapefruit. Um, these are different bush tucker fruits, including one of the ficus that has a great wild fig and achacha farm. Uh, visited, uh, tried some delicious. Um, uh, uh, pandan species, um, different things. That's in that's a cassowary, and then this is the most itchy thing in the world. It's called the, uh, the the gimpy gimpy, but it has edible fruits. But if you touch it, the wilt will last seven years. And so I of course touched it. Um, and then those are the fruits of the gimpy gimpy: the Amazon grapes, the Balkans, delicious melons, Central Asian melons, all different kinds of fruits, including cornus moss and aronia different kinds of cornus moss and, and selections of critigus. Uh, these taste great. That is Sorbus domesticum next to capers. Uh, Iceland found all different kinds of wild berries. Those are uh, rock brambles. The Articus, um, Rubus Articus. This is another stone bramble. Different kinds of wild bilberries, different crowberries. These are from uh, checking out the different lingonberry selections, many different kinds of lingonberries and all kinds of cool fruits, sea berries. Uh, these here taste god awful, and I don't know why anyone eats them. Um, and then this is one of the the, the, the quince flowering quinces. Uh, oh, plants. Yeah, uh, that was one of the barberry relatives uh, that they eat there. Um, cool looking mushrooms. Um, these are hawthorns. And uh, yeah, there we go. Oh, uh, a lot of fruit. I like fruit a lot. That's a that's a kind of a flower there. Um, yeah, that's a, one of the Dutchman's pipes in my greenhouse. It just, the flowers like this big. Yeah. And so uh, I grow a lot of fruits. Oh, question. So, so it's 320 acres. 
and it takes seven hours to verify all the fruits. So seven hours. 328 varieties. Uh, 3,000 varieties. Question. Find that these villages are picking all this fruit. How do you keep it from all rotting? And how do you care it when you're traveling around to bring some back? Well, you're supposed to send it to the APHIS uh, import station in Los Angeles and ship it from the site. Um, but sometimes, like, the, the, the staff will throw them away thinking, why is someone, you know, storing it? Or, you know, things happen. You know, yeah. Question. Um, I have another question, but I'm focused on the Crandall curve. And apparently, it's the one we wrote saying, Yes. Is the fruit worth the trouble? Very good. I quite like them. Um, so, Crandall current is one of the group of clove currents. There's a couple of selections. There's Crandall current, which is a little bit later and earlier, is another one that's called um, Missouri giant. Gotcha. Both of those are species within the group of sometimes they're called golden currents, sometimes they're they're called clove currents. I think they're the same species. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Saskatoons. Uh, Saskatoons, yeah. Is that something that we could find? Yes, so uh, they are fairly hardy. The genus is Amelincheria. Uh, the common names are Juneberries, uh, G-A-U-N-E-B-E-R-R-Y, also called Saskatoons. That's the marketing name out of Saskatchewan. They have a breeding program there where they're making Hexop, Juneberry, yeah. and then they're, they have, they're breeding quite a few different things. But we don't get the cold. I tried 10 varieties here, and I, I got them to fruit one year or mm -hmm. two years. Mm -hmm. uh, mine were from uh, Dr. Thompson up in Oregon. Yeah, yeah Maxine. And uh, hers were mostly from the University of Saskatchewan. Yeah, Saskatchewan's got a, a big breeding program of, of temperate crazy fruits. Yeah. Question about your cherries. Sure. Um, you're in Bakersfield, and it's really hot. Are you hiding the cherries on a, I don't know, a protected location, or are they okay to stay more water? Or? Um, so we do a lot of, of unique cultural practices to grow cherries in 120 degree temperatures. Um, so one of the things we do is we put clay, uh, kaolinite clay that we put onto the trees after we harvest the fruit as a sunscreen. Uh, we do have overhead misting systems that we can put if the temperature is really high. The real benefit of the misting is not for the summer, but for the winter. So cherries are native to North Africa and, you know, Sicily, Sardinia, some very warm parts of Europe. Uh, so in general, they can take a lot of it, but you, you have to be worried about mites because if there's dust and that gets on there, they can blow up with mites. Um, but having the, the kaolinite clay um, mixed to spray them to, to make it so that they are reflective, that cools them down quite a bit. We paint the trunks white, that also cools them mm -hmm. down. It decreases the risk of burrowing pests because cherries can, one thing that they get in warm climates is they'll get a sunburn and then that will become a necrosis. And then that will grow and then eventually that will kill the tree. So mm -hmm. if you have a spot that looks like it's dying, like a dead spot on the tree, you cut it and then you you paint it with a white latex paint if you're not organic. And then you seal it up and then it just does a lot better. Fantastic. Is that the same way that they uh, spray on the almond trees to hide the, the little... Uh, Yes. Is it kaolinite clay? Yeah, I think it probably is. Yeah. yeah it's, 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 a, it's a, and then the kaolinite clay is also high in calcium. And um, having calcium helps get keep the fruit harder and increases the shelf life of the fruit. Cool. Are you using lime sulfur also? We do not. Uh, so we would, so we do use some um, popcorn lime, especially in pre-planting to, to decrease our pH. We do a lot of pH controls uh, for the various plants because a lot of plants have very specific pH requirements. Um, what we do mainly is we do acid injection into our water mm -hmm. so that every time we water, we keep the, the, the water acidic because what will happen is that your water will have a alkali, you know, it will be alkali. So if you're using... 8.0 water to irrigate with, every time you irrigate, your plants are getting more and more alkaline. And so if you keep your water acidic, then the whole system stays acidic. The uh, it depends. In the organic areas, um, we'll often use milk acid is one of them. Yeah, lactic acid. 
uh, the, the, they call it milk acid is the product. And then it would be injected into tanks. And then that would be mm -hmm. when we irrigate, it would be in there. It could also be citric acid. Um, there's various acid, you know, weak organic acid. It has to be an OMRI approved right. organic so, source. So, 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 organic. so like, can you use sulfur to do that? Or is it find that the... the um, the, well, there would be pre-ground planting. You would, we would put in the sulfur before we plant the area so that it would lower the resident soil. And the way we do that is we auger holes and then we mix in, um, we have a, we have a whole bunch of stuff that we mix in the ground, including um, carbon, like long, like the, the, the black carbon. And then we put in, um, yeah, sulfur. We, we, we lower the pH so that it's, depending on what the species is, some things have very, very, you know, strong requirements and then target whatever is going to be going to there. Put in the sulfur and then to, as it, you supplement with the water that has to be uh, the, 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 the water will keep it whatever it is you want it to stay at. Yeah, yeah. Because other, otherwise, through time, it's just going to, you're going to lose your, your acid. So for the, for the cherries, what's the atrium? The, the cherries aren't, aren't as particular about it. Um, we have cherry orchards from six to eight on on pH uh, wow. because as they drop leaves and it goes into the soil all of that organic material will slowly increase the will decrease the pH is it worth it to get an expensive pH meter for soil or is it not cheap like that? I think using the, the cheap ones where you just put the thing in and see it, it will be okay yeah yeah I mean if you don't need to I mean there are things that it's like the bricks meters are pretty cool um and having a, a basic pH meters that should be fine, or even the ones that the pool a pool set, you know, whatever whatever is cheap. Yeah, it's like thirty dollar ones or three hundred dollar ones. So yeah, I mean, we we you know we're not you're not titrating something, so it's not like you need to go to the cheap ones. Okay. Yeah, yeah, for 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 a backyard use, it's not going to change that much. Um, you know, once every couple of years, unless it's something very specific, some kind of orchid or some kind of. The, the members of Ericaceae, which is the blueberry family, there's quite a few members of that group that have very that's specific. That's what I, yeah, that's yeah, that's, yeah. That's yeah. Cool. Any other questions about stuff? I can talk about the fruit later on that I brought. If you guys want to hear about that later. I wondered if you were ever going to go down to San Diego and get your press or any farm market or something. Uh, it's a long drive. We sell to specialty. So all of our stuff is available. And if it's something you guys see that we have and they don't have it, then you can ask them and they'll start purchasing it from me. So they buy every week, a bunch of crazy stuff from me. Yeah. Um, I have thought I th years ago we went, um, it said, have you found Anona Salzmanie in Africa? And if so, how did you like the taste of it? I've never tried the Salzmanie. I thought Salzmanie was a, was a Central American and Nona that had the hairy leaf, the hairs growing off of it from from um, from uh, Panama. There, there, there is a couple and Nonaceas that live in Africa. Most of them are Uvarias or and pseudo Uvaria, um, which are more like passion fruits. They have like long fruits. There's a couple of um, they have a Nona senegalensis, which has a fruit that's about this big with orange flesh. And then there's a Nona coracia, which it grows only about like a foot tall and then it has one like giant um fruit about this big that's the size of a, of a soursop i've seen plants of them but i've never tasted the fruit of either one of those and then there's also the um the endemonium which is called the jungle sop there's three species in that genus and they're supposed to be one of the largest of all tree fruits and they can be up to 40 or, or 50 pounds but i've never tried not them. quite as heavy as jackfruit up not not as pounds. yeah not as heavy as jackfruit so I think fifty pounds is where they're at. The last question, so we can do our raffle. Sure. Um, can I get some tickets for that one of them? I can get two. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So the last questions. Any other any other questions or anything else? Yeah. I don't have any ground squirrels. That that has not been a problem. I do have rabbits. Putting up little fences really helps. Um, and then putting up uh. I put barriers on the bottom of the trees. I put uh, cones around it so that it's hard to climb. Um, and it's, you know, about this big. And that that helps. So skirting the trees, making it so that there's no spot where the ground is touching so that you can't have it so easy to go everywhere and there's not so much cover because they're uncomfortable in, in open areas. But mm -hmm. the ringtails still climb over yeah. things. 
Cool. We're copying. Okay. Sweet. So do I just throw them? How do I? Uh, no, um, I have the tickets and then I'll be announcing yeah. them. And then, <laughs> hey, you guys, I'll talk about my stuff over there. How do I? How do I do this? Do you got to wait? Yeah, we're going to take it to me.